Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode number 20 of the Big Ten Watchdog News Podcast. I'm one of your hosts. I'm Graham Dynas. And I'm Taylor Seamer. This is episode number six of the 2023-24 season. Um, and before we get into all the Big Ten action that's occurred over the last week, uh, week and a couple days, just want to make sure to tell you guys to go to the link below and check us out on wherever you're listening, YouTube, Apple, or Spotify. Also make sure to give us a follow on Twitter. And still new, couple weeks old now, uh, the Big Ten Watchdog News blog website link will be posted in the description of this video. So make sure to check that out. I've got a weekly series, Taylor has a weekly series that we're putting out uh, on that platform. And so make sure to check that out. Uh, But without any further ado, let's just get right into the Big Ten stories from the last week. Starting uh, on Tuesday night, I believe, Purdue drops a road game to the Nebraska Cornhuskers, 88-72. Nebraska was on fire. Purdue, the number one team in the country, obviously. Uh, And they go down by 16 points on the road. And there are some question marks being thrown out about the Purdue Boilermakers. I'm going to let Taylor get into it. Uh, let's be honest, though. They're they're still the best team, right? Wisconsin they're is still there. the best team in the league. Wisconsin Wisconsin's is... schedule is weak, though. Yeah, well, they're. I mean, Purdue right, just lost to Nebraska. You know, they've lost to Northwestern. Both of which are teams that are going to finish upper middle in the back. tournament. Yeah, sure, but I mean, we just watched Wisconsin beat Northwestern. I guess this that, weekend. I mean, it's fair. I mean, it's fair. I don't know, the rest, Wisconsin has like two hard games left for the rest of the year. They're going to coast. And they're already 5-0. For for coach of the year. Yeah, that's, I mean, we kind of joked with with the Purdue people on Twitter about leaving the door open. The door is wide open, and Wisconsin is is pushing it very hard um, and keeping that door wide open. And I don't know if Purdue, like, it's mid-January, sure, but I don't know if Purdue has enough time to catch up. Like you said, like there's a couple tough games left on the Wisconsin schedule. That's it. Yeah, I think because Purdue has dropped games that they shouldn't, Wisconsin is the front runner to win the league. But I think still the best overall team is the is Purdue. Yeah, I mean, I, I yeah, I don't disagree with you there at all. I mean, Purdue still in my metric the number one team in the country, even with their loss at Nebraska. But Wisconsin's flying up. I had the most recently as a two seed. Um, I that was on Friday. Today's Monday. They might be uh, the, uh, uh, on the uh, if I could speak. They might be on the one seed line now. They're the, they were the number five team overall. Um, they're good. I, I people are saying that. I mean, the week schedule is a fair point, but they're very good and they're going to challenge Purdue for best team in the conference. Right, and I think part of the struggle has, is also the fact that Purdue, when you're ranked number one and you've won the title the past, you know, you've been up there in the past five years playing for it, everybody wants to beat you, and so you get everybody's best shot. Um, I mean, Nebraska shot 60% from three, made 14 of them. You can't really, you know, no matter yeah. who you're throwing at them, you can't really stop anybody if they're going to make 61% of their threes on a night and also get 17 points from the line and 50% from the field in general. I mean, the best program in the country arguably could be Purdue and they would lose to that as we saw on Tuesday. Yeah. So it's kind of goes to talk about no knock against Purdue. It's just, it's a state of college basketball. It's what college basketball is. Now we've seen, all these blue blood legendary coaches that take a step down now, uh, like Coach K and Roy Williams and Bayheim and all those guys. And the top of college basketball is a question mark. And Purdue has kind of elevated themselves up to that top. But I don't want to say, you know, the same old Purdue, but like, is it more of the, the top of the field has leveled themselves with where Purdue was as a, like a good, not great program? And now Purdue is the number one team in the country. And you've got teams like Houston and, I mean, UConn is great. But 
kind of like a new age of blue bloods um, that are not as indestructible as the Dukes and Carolinas and Kentuckys have been. Yeah, and I think part of that comes with like a lot of mid majors and lower tier high majors are seeing a boost from some NIL action that's allowing them to keep or get guys that no otherwise wouldn't have. Um, and I think you're kind of seeing this like same way in football, how the SEC has kind of fallen a little bit back to, or maybe everybody has kind of went up to them either way. I think that kind of the same thing is happening in basketball and maybe at a quicker pace because basketball is just so dynamic with so many games and so many teams um, that you can see those changes much quicker, which I personally think makes the game much more enjoyable to watch as a, as a college basketball on the whole fan. Yeah. Seeing a team, like none of these top tier teams are, are, you know, a full tier above, like they're not unbeatable by any stretch of the right. imagination. And we're seeing that seeing with Nebraska, Purdue, obviously. Yeah. Seeing Nebraska be able to go from basement of the league to probably finish his top five and has a win over Purdue and is going to get their first ever tournament win this year. Like, it's just so enjoyable. Credit to Fred Hoiberg, too, because he has done a tremendous job. He's only been there, what, four or five years now, and he's a full turnaround of the program, and, and they're a tournament team for sure. Um, you mentioned the, the bullseye, the target on their back earlier. That's something that I also mentioned in this week's Big Ten Spotlight article on our website like i just plugged earlier uh check that out link in the description you can find that story about purdue there will be a new team coming every week um so yeah a lot of stuff about purdue in that article as well um but even with all these losses like i said earlier they're still the number one team in the country ap poll has them at number two because uconn didn't lose this past week it's it's an enjoyable spot to be in in college basketball because like like we've been saying, anyone can win on any given night. Looking at Purdue's schedule as well. So up next, we go to Indiana on uh, on Tuesday night at 6 p.m. That is a game that always is, at least in the Mike Woodson era, has given Purdue some fits for sure. They've also got, they have a rematch against Northwestern coming up at the end of the month. Um, and then they have a home and home with Wisconsin, the first of which being in Madison on February 4th, and the last one being the end of the regular season on March 10th. They still have a game left against Michigan State and at Illinois. And even if they're able to go, I don't know how many games was that, you know, six and two in that stretch, and they are able to end up with a 16 and four, 15 and five record. You said Wisconsin's schedule is such that they they could very easily still lose out at that rate because the top tier of this conference is a step ahead of tiers two and three and four and whatever. Right. Wisconsin, if, if Purdue really needs to win that early Wisconsin game they have at the beginning of February, because they're already a game and a half back, uh, that could put them back into tied for first place. And then if each team wins out, that makes the last game of the season the conference championship game. Which never really that, that, that won't happen. But Right. But if Purdue loses that game in Madison, the hope drastically dwindles. Yeah. You and... lose the head to head and now you're two or three games back rather than one or zero. And you've got so much more to catch up on than you would if you win that game. Yeah, so Wisconsin has another game with Indiana just after uh, Purdue does, which is a tough stretch for Indiana. Um, they have a home against Michigan State, home against Purdue, like we said. And then outside of that, I mean, they have another game with Illinois. They have a game with Illinois in March as well. You're right. Like, Wisconsin currently 5-0. and You can definitely see them going 16-4, and 17-3. And... and in the last couple of years, that that's been more than enough to win. So, it's interesting. interesting right, dynamic. I mean, Purdue's yeah. already Purdue's already there, really. So, if they can, if Wisconsin only holds the three losses, they've pretty much got it wrapped up. 
Yeah. So the top of the Big Ten, we talked about that. Um, let's talk about the, the Doug McDaniel situation now. Uh, one of the funniest situations in college basketball of the last decade, I'm going to say, with the just oh, the – just the suspension aspect of it suspended for six games, but just on the road, I, this Mich- Michigan basketball team confounds me every day. I had heard this was coming for a while as in like right at the beginning of Christmas break um, from my guy who has some knowledge on the inside of the program. And I kind of laughed him off in the, phone call slash text exchange that went into hearing that because who has ever heard in the in their in any experience in college basketball where a player becomes one academically ineligible there are so many tutors they pass guys all the time and two that he would only be academically ineligible for away games yeah I've never heard of something more preposterous in my life than this idea. And then it came back. I It swung back through the channels about three or four days before the announcement came out that this, that this was legit happening. And I was even more flabbergasted that it just makes the program look like a high school team. Okay. Mm-hmm. This is what you have in high school where it's like, Okay, you got a C on your last history test. You're going to be, you know, we're going to work with the teacher and we're going to get you some time um, so you can't go to our next road game or our next two road games until you until the next test and then you can play again if you pass. This is the most high school level entirely run team I ever met. We have guys sitting out only road games we have our head coach openly giving up the head coach role to another person just because they're in a different city. We have it. it I, oh my! I could just go on for days, and it's it makes us look become the laughing stock of college basketball, and not because of anything that happens on the court that was already happening. Yeah. Now off the court, we just look like we have no idea what's going on. So six road game suspension. Already served one of them at Maryland, sixty four fifty seven loss. Purdue's up next, and whatever they, that game probably wasn't going to be a win anyway. Michigan State, that's a big one. Nebraska and Illinois back to back in the middle of February, and then on the twenty second of February, the last game will be served against Northwestern. Um, those, I mean, those are big games. This is your point guard. I want you to talk about. First of all, before we get to the game that just happened against Ohio State, I want you to talk about the Maryland game where Doug didn't play and just like the on the court dynamic. What was so different? If it like how, how different was it without Doug against Maryland? I've said this a couple times now, at least in person, to people that I know. I don't know if I've said it on here exactly. I'm not sure that this team like practices or watches film because they knew this Doug thing was happening. Like it. Like, it's been talked about in circles since I said before we left for Christmas break. So the team had plenty of time to prepare for a game without him, and they just didn't. It Like, nobody – they were throwing the ball everywhere. They were – they had no fl- – everybody was sticking on offense. There was no movement. The defensive side always sucks, so that one looked just normal. So I just don't understand – they knew this was coming all along and just didn't look like they prepared for it. Yeah. In, Especially in the second half. They didn't know how to close without a point guard. Last year, the big addition was Jalen Llewellyn coming in. Um, and this year, you expect – I mean, he, he gets injured mid-year, right? And Doug takes over and he assumes the role of, of starting point guard. And then – so now that Doug is gone, you would think – this guy's going to reascend back into his role. And he just really, I mean, just in this one game at least, he played 33 minutes, but he didn't really fit the Had shoes. a lot of cardio. Yeah. It's, but it's a, it is a tough situation because Doug, he's so important on the offensive side of the ball as far as scoring goes. And that was never Jalen Llewellyn's game. Um, 
Right, he's a facilitator guy. And now you're facilitating to a group that yeah, has shoot you know, or rebound yeah, or has three quarters of a score in yeah. Olivier and Kamwa. So it's an interesting situation. Maryland then goes on to beat Illinois on their home court. We'll talk about that later. Um, and then in this game today with Doug McDaniel, you beat Ohio State. Talk, I just talked about that. You were there, correct? Right. I was just there yeah, uh-huh. an hour ago. Uh huh. Um, it was, I'm not going to lie. I thought, okay, here we go. We've got this. I mean, I sent the tweet out. Michigan has their classic nine point lead at the half to lose by seven. That's what they always do. And then it, and then they actually started losing there. I think it was 61 59, maybe. And then they went on to what is that, a 10 to 2 run? I think it was 69 63 before they started fouling. So it's like clearly that ability is there. And Ohio State's not a bad team, they're a middle of the road <laughs> Big Ten team. And now they somehow can go on a 10 a 2 run to close the game in the last five minutes. Which is the opposite of what you've seen from Michigan recently. It's been a lack of ability to close. Right. Now, it's always yeah. the other team going on a 10-2 to two run, and then they get up by about four or five, and we have to start fouling. But instead, <clears throat> we were getting fouled. Thankfully, we made free throws because it still came down to, what, a four- or five-point game or something? It was a two-possession game, so if they threw something in, you know, and then fouled and we missed, I could t- I could just see it playing out again. It was just – but they finally pulled one off. I don't know how they – the ability's there. They have guys who can shoot the ball. They have guys yeah. who can take care of it. They have guys who can make free throws. And then they just – they have no, like, game plan, essentially. And I really didn't think they had a game plan today either. They just had some crazy shots that went in. Yeah, just better. I don't want to say not better isolation players that made shots. It was just shot making, right? Right. Then, we had a T Will, T Will, and Kamwa came in the last five minutes and had some big shots that were made. And also, Ohio State missed some shots that they probably shouldn't have. They had some open looks. Okay, so I know that you you've kind of hinted at you know you're just punting on this season for Michigan until the big man is gone, but. Now you're two and four with a win over a good Ohio State team. You're just two games back of second place at this point with two months left in Big Ten play. Where where are your hope levels at for the seven and ten Wolverines? Well, this is the same place that they were in last year, right? They were everybody in the conference was tied for second place, essentially. And they fumbled the bag with a much better team. And without guys having to sit out. I fully expect Michigan to finish in 12th or worst. Okay. They So they just need to show you more for you to hop back on board. <laughs> there's, no, there's no way. Looking at their schedule, I mean, they have to play Illinois. Illinois and Purdue, and Purdue next, yeah. They've got to go to Michigan State without Doug. And they get, then they get Wisconsin and then Nebraska back-to-back. And then at Illinois again without Doug, and then they've got a Purdue and Nebraska to close the season. They need to win thirteen out of their next fourteen games to even be. They need to win ten of fourteen to be sniffing the bubble. Thirteen out of fourteen gets them to like a ten or eleven seed. It's not going to happen. They're yeah. just give it up. Okay. Okay. Let's uh, let's talk about the team you beat today, Ohio State. Um, initially, whenever I, we were, we planned on filming on Friday, we didn't get to it. And I had a headline that was, is Michigan state in, in a pitfall right now? Then they go out, they just wax Rutgers on Sunday. And then Ohio state loses today to Michigan. So I just change it. Is Ohio state in a pitfall? They're now two and four in conference tied with Michigan. Um, we had talked about in the last couple episodes that, the sum of the parts was greater than the result with the Ohio State team last year, and we didn't expect it to keep up, and it was showing. It's looking eerily similar to what it did last year, and that's got to be scary for Ohio State fans. Yeah, I mean, this is – Ohio State looked relatively fine last year, 
and then went and lost. Um, they lost nine one, in a row two, at one point. Three, four, I know. five, six, seven games in January. Yeah. Last year. And so I've seen some people from the Ohio State Twitter talking about Holtman having some January blues. Mm hmm. But then also the fact that he's one game after today, I think he's one game under 500 in January as uh so after last year losing what I say, eight of them. Yeah. Seven, and then, yeah. so that means the year, bef the years before he front loaded his January so that they can claim that he's, you know, 500 now, but I mean, they've got a loss to Wisconsin and a loss to Michigan now in January with not, really an easy schedule coming the, up the Add indiana game indiana too. too yeah that's the one so they've got penn state which in theory should get them back on track but then they go at nebraska at northwestern at Il or at home versus illinois to close the to close the month they got could it. easily not win a game if they don't win that penn state game they could not win a game in, in all of january yeah and they, they've already lost to penn state back in december they blew that game too on the road it's this team hasn't been great at closing, and that's their big issue. They've they've blown several games now, and we thought last year after last year's team, this year was the year they're turning the corner, and they're back to being a high end Big Ten team, and that's simply just not the case. Yeah, it really I, looked I, like it early in the season, you know, especially after they beat Alabama handily, and then they went on like a what is that like an eight or nine game win streak. And they lost to Penn State, won four more, and now they're back into mm -hmm. who knows what land. I remember last year around, it was early January, early Big Ten play, maybe like a week and a half ago in our season. Um, and then Ohio State played Purdue. I believe it was in Mackey. It might have been in Columbus, though. Uh, and Ohio State lost a close one. And I, at that point, in the season looked at those teams and said, these are the two best teams in the big 10 and Ohio state was clearly not that last year. And it's kind of looking like a similar situation is emerging where hopefully it's not a complete pitfall where the bottom falls out and they're just falling for a full month and a half. Um, because I like this Ohio state team. They're fun, but they just cannot close games. And right now I have them sitting just outside, uh, the tournament they're they're on the bubble and they're not in and this loss today is obviously not going to help with that either even though it was on the road but regardless it's a game yeah you can't i mean drop. i had them i had them you know top five in my power rankings or maybe they were six um but now they've fallen to eight and a really bad loss today to michigan probably puts them at nine or ten i mean if minnesota wins today they'll definitely jump them yeah. um so that puts them at nine it's just so much was there. The pieces again are there and the execution is not. Yeah. And so that's, uh, does this fall on Chris Holtman? And I think a lot of people would say, yes, it does. I'm not going to say it, but I think that's kind of what the rumblings are and have been frankly for, which is weird over because a year now. when he first got there, he was relatively successful and could close these games. So like, I just don't know. He's got to be having some sort of – maybe he needs like a change on the coaching staff or something, a better scouting guy for late games or a better late game defensive or play caller or offensive play caller or something. But, yeah, I don't know. Something has flipped in their time from when he first got there to now. Yeah, and so that's a situation we're obviously going to keep an eye on is Ohio State. Um, and we'll see because – like I've mentioned previously, the Big Ten does not look favorable in as far as tournament conversations go. Because we're looking at a potentially now a five bid league with two of I'm the bids five at most. The two of the bids being Nebraska and Northwestern. And you know, so say what you want about the Big Ten, but right now there's just a lot of mediocrity and a lot of the step below mediocrity of you know poor play um and so we'll see because i mean maryland got a big win we'll see if they can rise iowa's looking to get back on track maryland or minnesota i mean could be a team that emerges 
uh, they have the resume right now to where if they keep winning, they'll be in the conversation. But, you know, we haven't seen it from this Minnesota group the last three years. So a lot of teams that their fates are left to be decided, but it doesn't look, you know, pretty. It's not optimistic for these teams. Again, normally around this time in the show, we do our Big Ten Spotlight, but once again, we've already talked about Purdue today, and that's who I wrote about last week. So make sure you head on over to our website and and read that piece that I wrote about Purdue. Uh, go in depth on their rotation, uh, their upcoming schedule with, with, with which one of their games has now been played, so don't worry about that. But uh, their recent loss to Nebraska, what it all means, make sure you check that link in the description. And we'll just get into my tournament metric rankings for the Big Ten. Um, and of course, these metrics were calculated prior to the results of Michigan, Ohio State. So keep that in mind. Uh, as number four, or I guess we start from the top, same as, as it was last week at the top, Purdue, Wisconsin, Illinois. Let's talk a little bit about Wisconsin and then some about Illinois. Um, Wisconsin this past week, right, you look at the schedule. They, let's see, they beat Nebraska by 16. They go on the road and beat Ohio State. Then they, at home, cover at the last second, win by eight against Northwestern. That was huge for us in getting that one right. Um, 5-0 and in conference and looking to be a, one, a potentially a one seed at this point. Um, again, I just, I just think they're really good. Yeah, I think I think they they play together really well as a team, very fundamental. And then AJ Store can just do whatever, and you know, pretty much cover any lack, like any place that the team is lacking on any given night, he just picks up, so you don't even notice. Can we talk about Max Klesman? Because this week it was in the Ohio State game, and then again against Northwestern, he has just been incredible as of late. I don't want to. I, his second halves in both games were were really strong. I want to get the exact numbers right, so I'm pulling these up. Uh, 18 against Ohio State, and then 24 against Northwestern. Like, if you're getting that type of contribution from a Max Klesman, who's really just kind of a 3 and D guy for this team, they're unstoppable in Big Ten play. If Max Klesman and A.J. Storr and Wallen Crowell down low – Chucky Hepburn, if Connor Seijin's coming back, which he is, he's starting to make shots again. Like this is a deep and very talented Wisconsin group that we talked about yeah. Ohio State here. We talked about Ohio State being the team that, you know, last year was a fluke and this year things have changed. Wisconsin's really the team that last year seems to be the outlier in a, between years where they're top end Big Ten teams. Yeah, and if if you get production like that from a guy especially one who doesn't necessarily play much or at least a big role anywhere in the Big Ten Conference that's pretty much unstoppable there's not many guys who can just shoot their way into a lineup uh, in the Big Ten like maybe uh, one of the guards from Purdue there's a guy or two at Illinois uh, Klesman obviously the list pretty much ends there in the Big Ten yeah, no, and the three, the the scoring is just a bonus too with him because he is a great defender, and you add AJ Store on top of that, and he guards, and Chucky Hepburn is a great guy at getting in passing lanes and getting on ball steals. They're great on the perimeter defensively. They have Crowell to rim protect. They're good, solid defensively, and now with AJ Store, they have a level of athleticism on that they can abuse the transition game, which they've never done before. It's it's a different Wisconsin team that I would be really scared of if I was Purdue or any other team trying to compete in this conference. Yeah, I don't want to match up with them, especially, you know, even if they drop a game or two, so they fall to like a three seed, that's not a team that I want to catch anywhere in the first two weekends. No, and that team two years ago was a three seed, and they were not scaring anybody. This team as a three seed would would open some eyes. And it's weird because A.J. Storr was not, you know, a star player at St. John's, but you add him, and he just kind of elevates everyone else's role because they don't have to take on as much responsibility. 
it's it's really it was a great at portal edition probably the best in the big 10 i mean marcus damask is great i love marcus damask but you're hard pressed to tell me that there's not a more important acquisition than aj store in the portal yeah no, i think that's completely uh, fair speaking of illinois uh this week uh, since we last filmed, they had the, the five-point loss at Purdue where they had the second-half comeback, then a three-point narrow escape victory over Michigan State, and then the nine-point loss against Maryland. So their numbers have fallen, and they, if I can pull it up, I believe they'd be approaching like a six seed in my metrics ranking, which they were a four previously, um, but still in third place in the conference and by a relatively decent-sized margin over the rest of the group. Yeah, and, you know, I've kind of said this a little bit with the Illinois team, is they kind of live and die by the three, um, which is a little more true whenever they had Shannon, just because he could drive and kick a little easier and get that kind of style of offense sparked. Um, But it's still really true for this team, and Maryland is like the best defensive team in the conference. So they don't make guys, they don't make guys, you know, miss very often or they don't let guys make very often, I guess I should say, because they're so in your face and ready to go that Illinois kind of struggled with that. Even when they got open shots, there was always like that thought in the back of their mind that somebody was coming to be right in their grill when they were going to shoot it. So they um, missed a lot more than I think they normally do. And I think that's the biggest contributor. I mean, they only got off 67 points in a home game when people think they're, you know, a top three team in the, in the, in the conference. That second half was brutal. They just, there, that's the first half you could say, I mean, they scored 39 points and that was, that was a decent number, but they shot so poorly in the second half against Maryland. A lot of, of looks at the rim that didn't fall. All of the threes didn't fall in the second half. Luke Goody was on fire in the first half and he, offensively at least, was not nearly as present in the second half. And so there's a lot of ways you could point the finger. A lot of different areas. They were giving up a lot of easy looks on the other end too. Uh, Maryland just has Illinois' number. You text me and you're like, Maryland owns Illinois in the all-time series. And I was like, I'm aware. They're, they're a problem. And I figured this team was talented enough and Maryland was not talented enough to where – it may not matter, and they just came in and out hustled and just beat us straight up. And so, yeah, in those daily matchups things that I post, um, you find some nuggets sometimes. And after that game, I'm pretty sure Maryland is up fifteen to seven all time. Um, and I think a good portion of those have come recently. I believe it's ten of the last thirteen. Yeah, they have won, so, and so yeah, it's it's. A problem that Brad's had with this Illinois group is beating Maryland, and <laughs> this year's no different. They get another shot at them in College Park, and if they're able to win that one, then I'd say cancels out. But, again, winning on the road in conference, especially the Xfinity Center is one of the better venues in the conference as far as home court advantage. So that game will be very important for the Illini season if they want to try and keep pace with the Purdue's and Wisconsin's up top. Uh, number four, I believe, let's see, last week they were number five. So up one spot is Nebraska coming off the win against uh, against Purdue. But also you saw a 16-point loss at the hands of Wisconsin on the road and then an 18-point loss against Iowa on the road. So a one and two week, and they still move up a spot because of how big that win was against Purdue. Yeah, I mean, this team – really has the ability to do crazy things like beat Purdue just because they have a guy named Casey Tominaga who can just shoot you out of the out of the gym. And if not, they've got a guy named Rink Mast who can just pound you inside for like the the old fashioned like short corner jump hooks and like you know Valley mid range mid range fadeaways that he just throws in all the time and I just don't get it. But, I mean, with a name like Rink Mast, you either are, like, you're either a meme player or you're, like, the next coming of Dirk Nowitzki from the mid-range. And he somehow, like, walks both lines mm-hmm. because he's a goofy-looking dude but yet plays a gigantic role. 
Speaking of, I mentioned earlier in the season we're going to have an all Big Ten name team. I'm still working on that. That'll that'll be coming out shortly. I'm excited for that. Um, yeah, it, the, I feel like last year, like I said, Nebraska kind of turned a corner last year midway through Big Ten play where they were just kind of a collection of guys playing basketball, and then they kind of meshed together really well at that point last season. And, you know, like I, I said on Twitter, they, they stopped becoming a group of misfits and they became a basketball team. And now you add a rank mast and a Bryce Williams to this group who are two, you know, 12 point per game scorers plus. They're, I mean, they're good. They're, they're tournament good. And if this was Michigan State or Indiana or Michigan or one of the teams with a little higher pedigree, then no one would be discussing if this was a bubble team. But since it's Nebraska, that's what people are talking about. This team is so obviously, you know, an eight or a nine seed at this point, and they have room to improve on that as well. Um, so, I, I mean, they're just very exciting. C.J. Wilcher off the bench. they're eight or nine who, if they win their first game, can take down the one seed of their bracket. They have. They did it. We saw them do it on whatever day. Was that Tuesday? Was I right? Yeah. yeah. On Tuesday, January 9th, they took down the best team in the country. And so they're obviously capable. Number five in the rankings, also up a spot from last week, is going to be Northwestern. They profited off of a big win against Michigan State on Sunday, a 14-point win where they just kind of shellacked them. And that kind of led Izzo to spiral in the presser after. We'll talk about that when we get to Michigan State. Um, but then a four-point narrow victory on the road against Penn State on Wednesday. And then they t- capped off the week with that eight-point loss against Wisconsin on the road. Um, so they kind of, again, the Michigan State win, I had them in my first four out last week. They're up to a, like a 10 seed now. So they're probably in that last four buys range, maybe just off that level. Um, but they're, I don't, they're obviously not comfortably in, but – they're not they, – it would take a really bad loss for them to fall off the line at this point. Right. They would need to lose to a Penn State or a Rutgers or a Michigan or something to really – to kind of – and they need to lose bad to knock them off. Next game um, is, is Wednesday at home against Maryland. Again, that would, be a, that would be a drop that would sting. Right. So I think if they kind of just play even basketball, they'll be – maybe one of the last four in, I mean, for the rest of the conference mm-hmm. season. They're not, That's reasonable. Yeah, they're, not, they're nothing exceptional, but they do have a decently sized resume that they might be able to sneak in over somebody else at the end if it comes down to it. That Michigan State win was huge, I think, because they were kind of flying by the seat of their pants with a Purdue win, and that was kind of what was keeping them in. The win against... Michigan State is a second quality win that kind of solidifies that they're not a complete fluke with that one win. Um, And that's kind of all you need to be in the conversation in mid-January. Now they have to keep building, and I think that they're capable of it. We saw it last year. Um, But that's why – and the fact that, like, this is a team that's number five in the conference rankings is is unfortunate and sad for – it speaks to the state of affairs in the conference, but – but there's a, there's a firm line, I'd say, between five and six as well. Yeah, I would say. I, I mean, I still currently have Northwestern at the seven in my power rankings just because I feel like they are going to fall onto some hard times and they play some – they play tough teams. I mean, they've got to play Illinois, Ohio State, and Purdue three in a row, and they've got to finish this – they've got to finish with Michigan State and Minnesota. So they could be – you know, a team that finishes at the lower, on the wrong side looking in because they really don't have any other significant win opportunities on their schedule. That's a problem that's plagued Rutgers the last couple years, being that fringe bubble team that has kind of a weak, not just like a not as strong resume as some of these other teams, even though they're in dogfights every night in a deep conference, it's, it's, a problem to monitor as well. Number six, we just talked about Ohio State. In the Monday edition of these rankings, Ohio State's at six. Looking at the results of today, there's a, a very strong chance that they would be number eight 
or potentially even lower, depending on the results of tonight's game between Iowa and, Miss- and Minnesota. Um, but for now, they're six. But we've talked about them. Uh, I had them, like I said, just outside the bubble. Um, another team that's kind of right there that was number seven, will definitely be number six tomorrow, is Michigan State. Yeah, I mean, from where they started preseason, they were, you know, top of the league, top five preseason team. Mm-hmm. Then they have a very large fall from grace. They had a slight bump up lose to Northwestern, and now I think they're kind of back on the up. It's Again, like a, it's an interesting – the team is has an interesting feel to it when you watch them. It's like this team has the ability and clearly has shown it. I mean, if you watch the Baylor game at all, you know, yeah. you just were score watching. But they just don't produce enough consistently to be in the conversation. And, yeah, consistency is obviously a problem that we've mentioned before with them. Um, but yeah, like you said, dropped Northwestern, they had the three point loss at Illinois. And then, like we said, they waxed Rutgers on Sunday. Um, and that kind of is keeping them firm at this, just outside the tournament field and just like slightly off the bubble. So any, I mean, they're two and four in conference now. They're not going to finish as a team that. I mean, I don't see them being an eight and twelve team in conference. I think they'll win at the bare minimum ten or eleven games in this conference, and then it'll be up to the committee to say we've seen this team be really good, or are they not consistent enough to warrant a bid? Um, and Izzo is seemingly thinking that this team might not be good enough to get a bid. Funnily enough. That presser was hilarious. Well, you look at like you look at their metrics, they're solidly tournament team in the net and the Ken Palm. I mean, they're Are they sixteenth in Ken Palm? Yeah, they're top twenty five in both at this point, but yet their on the court product is keeping them off because they just can't seem to take care of business against teams that they are clearly better than. Yeah, they're they're littered with bad losses early in the season and then they keep any time that they start to build their credibility back up, they sprinkle in another loss that makes you say, well, maybe not. They're going to have to fix that if they want to be a lock on Selection Sunday and be that sixth team from the Big Ten. Um, but until then, they're they're on the outside looking in. Number eight, I've got the Indiana Hoosiers, another a team that's kind of the opposite of Michigan State. The results on the court are not too shabby their, you know, fringe bubble tournament level metrics. But then you look at the the net as them as 97th in the country, right? They're they're probably in the 80s in Ken Palm. The metrics do not like this Indiana team at all, but what they've done says otherwise. Yeah, and I'm not sure that I really like the Indiana team either. They kind of just – The outside of like that Kansas game, I, I would love to see them in this Purdue game they have coming up. That'll be like okay. a real tell on this team. But outside of that, it's like they play hard, but do they play like well? It's kind of a the pieces don't they just don't fit together that well. Whenever you have the next guy in house that's gonna be a big the, the next Indiana guy was Malik Renew. And then you bring in Khalil Ware as well. And so now you've got two post presences, as well as your your big freshman acquisition is McKenzie Mbako, who's a guy that's not a tremendous shooter and you know probably should be playing the four, but is actually he's forced to be a three man in this role, all while you're being point guarded by Xavier Johnson, a guy that's not a great outside scorer. Whenever you're relying on on Trey Galloway to be, you know, your main three point shooter, it's it's just a team that they don't mesh well together. But you you have to trust in Mike Woodson, and that's why you're getting these results that you're getting because Mike Woodson he coaches it well. It's tough because he dealt himself his own hand, but it wasn't a very good one. You know what I mean? 
Yeah, no, I think, I, I mean, I can't disagree with anything you say there. The X's and O's that they have from Woodson are great. The shots just don't go in or the stops just don't come on defense, even though they're in the right spot. The guys are just making. They're, they need, they're, they have a bunch of depth pieces that are not, they're depth pieces, they're not role players. You know what I mean? Like they're all guys that, you know, they can come in and give you a couple minutes, but what are they, you know, actually giving you off the bench? And if those guys can step into true roles and, you know, provide something for this team, especially just some like any shooting at all for that matter, um, then this team is, is a tournament team. But they have five starters that don't fit super well together. Xavier Johnson has come back from injury and might be hurting this team, frankly. And then you have your bench, which has a lot of guys that are, you know, not great not good, but just okay. It's a it's a weird collection of players that Mike Woodson is probably going to lead to at least like a fringe bubble spot. Um, and that's, you know, he should be in consideration for coach of the year for that as well, even though, you know, is it his fault that this team's built this way? Yeah. I mean, I've said it before on the Twitter. It's kind of a running bit at this point. Um, that the best Xavier Johnson in college basketball plays at Southern because this Xavier Johnson at Indiana plays like one minute he's, you know, top of the mountain. The next minute he's deeply in the Valley, top of the mountain, deeply in the Valley. And it's just like, there's so much inconsistency with him. I feel like he could be a piece they could build around and play around, but he just hasn't shown that he can stay solidly in a place that they can build around it's especially, really easy to build around a guy who's mid-level or top of the mountain but you can't build around a guy who has the opportunity to be in the valley especially a veteran guy like xavier johnson who's been with the program for three years now and has played college basketball for two or three years before that like he's an old guy he should be the model of consistency for this indiana team and him not being that is what's holding them back um, but if he's able to, you know, maybe like it, he's another guy, if he can accept his role and, and just be, you know, the facilitator that kind of, you know, is the catalyst that can drive the offense without being the piece, the scoring guy, then, then they'll be fine. Um, okay. Up two spots from last week is the Iowa Hawkeyes. I said, are the Iowa Hawkeyes. Up from 11 to 9, coming off a 9-point win against Rutgers, followed by an 18-point win at Nebraska. They're just a different team at home, and they had two home games this week. And so they have vaulted themselves up without losing to this number 9 spot. Yeah, they must have some sort of, like, sixth sense when they're in, uh, I or when they're in Iowa City because the ball just goes in, but it doesn't anywhere else. And it's like, okay. that's kind of expected, you know, from teams that are the home team, that they get a little extra home team balance. But it's the, the, the differences in percentages between home and away is so drastic that there's got to be something else there. They average like 95 points at home. It's crazy. I like, how, how do you have, how are you not a lock for a tournament team if you're averaging 95 points at home? Right. Because they that average just, like 65 on the road. It's it just, it's shocking. It's two different ball clubs, and you've got the Owen Freeman has been great as a freshman, and Ben Cricky is their four guy, and Tony Perkins scores the ball. All these guys, Peyton Sanford, obviously, they have guys that score the ball. What happens in games where they're not in Iowa City to where this team is not scoring the ball as efficiently as they as they do at home? And it's a thing that, A, Big Ten home teams have been incredible all year this year, all year last year. It's something that we've noticed very quickly and said it's it's just really hard to win on the road in the Big Ten. But it's not necessarily what they're doing to other teams in their arena. It's more of what they're doing themselves. It's like, I guess they say, you know, defense travels, offense doesn't. That's, you know... 
put an Iowa Hawkeye on a poster with that quote, and and it makes perfect sense. So the 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 dictionary definition of that motto. Number ten, the team that Iowa plays tonight in Minneapolis, uh, the Minnesota Golden Gophers, down one spot from number nine last week. Uh, this past week, they did beat a Maryland team by three on Sunday, as well as what a twelve-point loss to Indiana. Yeah. So, kind of what you'd expect from this Minnesota team. They're what are we looking at now? Three and two in conference, looking to be four and two with a home win today. The surprise of the Big Ten, I'd say for sure. Yeah, I mean. Well, not to me. I mean, I called this kind of early in the season. I I, I uh, put that on a tee for you. I knew I knew as soon as it came out of my mouth, I was like, he's gonna he's gonna talk about that again. I did say that I thought Minnesota would finish ten or eleven. I think in that episode, um, maybe twelve. Um, I can't remember now. I remember that I said they would not be in last place like they have been the last couple of years. Um, and you're seeing why they've just got they've got no real star on the team. But everybody knows their role, and they do it happily. And Ben Johnson can run some X and O's. They're eleven and one at home, which I mean, we said no, no one's bad. I mean, Michigan's four and four at home. Everyone else at most has two losses in the conference at home. They're eleven and one, like that. That's crazy good. And so Iowa is coming to the barn tonight, where they've underperformed on the road. Um, this would be. If Iowa was able to win this, that would be huge for building their resume. Even though Minnesota's not going to go as a marquee win by any means, that's just a massive step to prove that, hey, we can go on the road and win. And for Minnesota, beating Iowa kind of legitimizes what they've done so far this season and would give them, you know, a, a middle of the Big Ten type feel rather than a, you know, plucky underdog. Right. And there's there's kind of like a tier level of teams. There's the teams that, you know, can only beat the teams that are worse than them, and they lose to the teams that are the same as or better than. And then there's the teams that beat the teams that are the same as and worse than and can sometimes surprise a team that's better than and lose to the teams that are way better than. So Minnesota and Iowa are on the same level, and I think a win by Minnesota could elevate them closer to that upper level where they beat teams that are on the same level as them. I really, I really am a fan of Minnesota tonight. This is, yeah, this is a game on a Monday night, big 10 game, which doesn't happen very often with two teams that are not, you know, making splashes, you know, it's going to be running alongside two NFL playoff games at different times, but it's, it's a very important game as far as big 10 goes, because Iowa is looking to get to 500 and Minnesota's looking to get to four and two in conference play. Like th those are important spots to be in when you're a third of the way through the conference season. Uh, Rutgers slots in at number 11, also down a spot from last week. If you take a look at what they did, they had the loss to Iowa over the weekend, like we said, in Carver Hawkeye. They beat Indiana at their place in the rack on Tuesday. The rack magic strikes again and then obviously get beat by Michigan State on Sunday. Um, you said that every game, every single game for the rest of the season for this Rutgers team is must win, and I concur with you there. They're one and four in conference, sole possession of last now that Michigan won, uh, and they're nine and seven. They, they're going to need to get to 19 wins at least to have a chance, and that's you know going 12 of their next 14 or 15. Yeah, it's I, I did tweet that that Rutgers needs to win pretty much every game since they dropped the Michigan State game. And I th and I I think that's true just because they've already they have no resume left. So their entire re or they have no resume so far. Their entire resume for anything for the tournament would be everything that's upcoming for them. They have nothing to fall back on. Yeah. They have no I big win earlier in the season. That's giving them any kind of boost. The good news for them, the one of their bad losses that they took early in the season, they're on opening night, no less, against Princeton. They lose by seven at home. Princeton is really good. 
that's that's not like that loss is looking better and better day by day. Um, ten point loss to Mississippi State as well. That's a team that just beat Tennessee, right? They lost to Wake Forest, who's looking like a tournament team. Um, their losses aren't as bad as as you'd think. The issue is, you know, a one point win against Stonehill, right? A narrow escape against Bryant. You know, they, they did beat Georgetown. They beat Seton Hall. That's a good win now. Just this resume, they don't they. They've scheduled weak non-conference schedules the past couple of years. And this year they take a step up as far as non-conference scheduling goes, but this group isn't quite as good as the last couple have been. And so they still were not able to get a signature win in the non-conference. So they're going to need to state a claim for a signature win. They have a very interesting game that we might talk about later on Wednesday night against Nebraska in New Jersey, that would be a good start for them. That's who they have up next. So we'll talk about that later. Uh, Number 12 is Maryland. They, I believe, were they? They were 13, so they jumped Michigan. Michigan's 13, so they flipped spots because of Maryland's win against Illinois. Uh, Also this week, we've got a three-point loss to Minnesota and then a a win over Michigan head-to-head on Thursday night. That's right. So they're number 12 now, and they're a team that I thought was out of it. But that win over Illinois, you know, it can't be overstated how important that win is because now I'd say they're in the same position as Rutgers to where if they are able to not run the table but win 12 of 15, win 13 of 15, if they can finally win some game, more games on the road in conference play, uh, they're 500 in the Big Ten right now. They only have six losses. They could they could do it, realistically. Yeah, and Maryland is in one of those situations where they're fine at home. They can play great defense. Their problem is, is that they can't outscore you at all. So, it, I mean, they won the Illinois game because they held them to 67 points. But they lose other games in similar fashion because they'll – they'll give up 70 and not be able to get to 70, you know? Yeah. They were lucky that shots were falling in that Illinois game. They get to 70, held them to 67, you're fine. But that doesn't happen every night, especially on the road to the Big Ten. That was a one-time off thing, I think. So that's going to be a dynamic that is going to plague them and keep them out of the tournament again. I said this, I believe, in the last episode, but maybe it was in private with just me and you. But if they really want to – make it a leap they need Deshaun Harris Smith to be good and he just hasn't been up to this point and even against Illinois he wasn't great and I was saying you know maybe next year he can make that leap and be you know the guy that they recruited to be really good but now that they have this game under their belt the sooner that that leap can be made the better because if he can become a viable third or fourth option behind young Reese and Scott, then we're looking at a team that has a few pieces, guards really well, and, you know, at times can scheme it up to get easy buckets like they did against Illinois. And that's a team that, you know, might be scary to run into in a Big Ten tournament. Not a, And if they're able to end up at 11-9, and nine, that may be good enough for a double bye if they beat the right people. It's a possibility. And so – Something to keep an eye out for Maryland if they only have to win three games in a row. I, I just I don't want to rule it out. It's too early to rule them out completely. Um, so, yeah, and then Michigan at 13, talked about that. And then at 14 remains Penn State. Um, they had a, a strong-ish second half against Purdue. I mean, they they, <laughs> they went into halftime, and I thought – Man, they're never gonna backdoor this eighteen and a half, and then they did. They won. They lost. They did by sneak 17. it in. They did sneak it in. They're uh, that. Despite being, you know, the worst team in the conference, allegedly, they're four and two against the spread in Big Ten play. So, well, too bad the spread doesn't get you into the tournament. So. No, it doesn't. And they're not the gonna get in regardless. Win your either. Yeah. So, Connie Clary's fun though. So, they're fun to yeah, watch. Nice. 
I think it's it's well, we could go with funny to watch whenever like oh boyle starts trying to do things and I'm like oh, wow. my guy, I I feel your we need that you know that basketball account like white b ball pains on Twitter. Okay, yeah. This makes me makes me think of that account every time I try to see oh boyle like try to go through his legs and try to like cut between two guys and throw something up. It just oh I'm like dude, I get it. Because there's nothing, there's no other offense, but it, it's comical. Yeah, I enjoy watching Penn State for that reason. Penn State, regardless of how you're watching them, if you're not a fan, it can be fun as long as you don't go in with high expectations. You know, they can they they can surprise you if you have low expectations, and they probably will because they they play hard. I think Mike Rhodes is like I said in the last episode, he's doing a, a fine job. He just he is yet to understand what he needs to do to take the leap in the big 10, which is a problem that a lot of new big 10 coaches face, especially when they come into a program that, you know, of, of a Penn state caliber, not a, a Michigan state or Purdue caliber. So, so that is my tournament rankings. Just a few minor changes this week from last week. Uh, and then again, typically at this point in the episode, we do our weekend predictions, but the weekend just happened. So we're going to take a look at the week ahead and point out some games that we find particularly interesting. The first of which I already mentioned, Nebraska at Rutgers. Um, like we said, Rutgers, this would be a, a huge step in them climbing the ladder to get back into the conversation of being on the bubble. Nebraska getting a road win in the rack would be massive for them to – so again, legitimize their tournament stakes. You know, they're like I said, they're sitting on eight seed. A typical eight seed team is not losing to this Rutgers team even on the road, and so I think that'll be a good litmus test for both of those teams. Yeah, Nebraska has looked a little shaky on the road. They pulled out a couple wins, um, but they've also had some kind of bad losses on the road. So um, I'm curious to see what they do and what was at least for the last two or three years, maybe not this year, the hardest place to win in the Big Ten. So, It's a fun under-the-radar game. Uh, here's a game that's not under the radar. Tomorrow night, Purdue at Indiana on Tuesday night. Um, another one, Indiana seems to have Purdue's number as of at least recently, and they've got the target on their back. Purdue needs to be able to win a road game here to stay alive, like we said, in the Big Ten race and hope that Wisconsin doesn't run away with it by the end of January. Yeah, and in rivalry games like this, you never know what's going to happen. Just because Purdue is the better team on paper and even on film, they could not be that night because it's at Assembly Hall and Indiana can work wonders against Purdue. Let's say typically you say the you know rivalry game anything can happen in football, that that's a huge football cliche. But you know it's it's Indiana, right? In forty nine states, it's just basketball. But you know it it's king of of the state of Indiana, and that rivalry is it's football esque, you know. And the football rivalry is you know whatever. But these two teams year in year out they they battle and. You know, underdogs tend to win, especially at home in this rivalry. So Indiana, I'm excited to watch it. Even if this Indiana team is not looking great, they can definitely stake a claim and say, hey, we're a tournament team too, maybe, with a win. Um, what else do we have? What else do we have? Michigan State hosts Minnesota on Thursday night. Minnesota has a chance to go on the road, depending on how this game goes tonight. signature win for the Gophers, if they can do yeah, that. Yeah, Michigan State just coming off a, a home win against Rutgers needs to to double down and get a home win over Minnesota and say, we're, we're not going to settle for being 500 in conference. We're going to climb our way back up. That could be huge. And then the guard matchup, anytime that you are playing Michigan state, it's fun to watch the guard matchup with Hawkins and Mitchell and Carrington for Minnesota. Excited to see how they are able to match up with those Michigan State guys. Um, Friday night, we've got Indiana at Wisconsin, which, you know, depending on how Indiana does tomorrow night, could be a letdown game where Wisconsin steamrolls them. Or 
Indiana could have the best week in in the Big Ten this year by beating both of them. And cause real chaos if they did that in the standings. Yeah, because you're looking at Indiana, they're four and two right now as well. And that would put them one game back, maybe a half game back of Wisconsin with the head to head. So that could throw a wrench in it for sure. And then you could be looking at a Big Ten team who's a fringe tournament team winning the conference in the regular season potentially. And that would be shocking. Um, and there's the obvious one. Uh, the Illini travel to Ann Arbor on Thursday night in our our first Super Bowl, the first Big Ten watchdog bowl of the year. Um, hey, and don't, don't let the Wolverines get hot. They figured out how to close games now with the game today against Ohio State. Look out. Illinois is in a get-right spot. That's something I wouldn't want if I were you guys. I never want to play a good a good team coming off a loss. That's that scares me, and it scared me with Michigan State last week. So be prepared. Although you know, if, if that, this is a loss for the Illini, hopefully it doesn't start a spiral. I mentioned you know so much on my blog about Illinois two weeks ago about how connected they were, right as a group. That's what everyone's saying, connected, connected. Against Maryland, they were not connected, right? If you watch a play, it felt disjointed. It was it was different than what it had felt like since Terrence had gone out. It was a different team um, last night, last night, yesterday afternoon, than it had been in prior games without Terrence. If they're still disjointed against Michigan, we may have a problem on our hands. Until then, I'm just going to believe it was a letdown game, a typical trap game. Um, but you drop two games to Maryland and Michigan in the same week, that does wonders for tanking your tournament stock. So can't let that happen. Yeah, if they lose that game, they fall back into like the, oh, are we going to be an 8-9 game and have to play a one seed again and not make the second weekend? Yeah, really we, 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 we don't want that. I can tell you right now. <laughs> I do not want to be in an 8-9 game. I watched the the 8-9 game last year. I was there, and Arkansas was, was way better than an 8 seed. Um, and they showed it against an Illinois team that probably was a 9 seed. So, so yeah, those are the games next week that we're, we're kind of highlighting. We'll have another episode at the end of this week to go over the weekend again and what we saw in these most recent games. But, yeah. Uh, do you, you have anything else to add before we wrap this up? No, I'm uh, I'm last year at about this time. I was like, you know, Big Ten place is ramping up. It's time to get excited. And, you know, it's cold as heck outside. So might as well just sit inside and watch Big Ten basketball. But now I think with how mid the, the conference is this year, it, it takes a little more encouragement for you guys to come out and watch. So um, I would just say that even though some of the teams aren't as good as they normally are, uh, there are some surprises like we've talked about with Minnesota and Maryland and Nebraska. Uh, so uh, get excited to watch those teams um, because it's always fun to watch great Big Ten basketball. So our, the weather in the in Big Ten country right now is representative of Big Ten basketball right now. Um, so allow the weather to guide you to Big Ten basketball and watch some, you know, mediocre to below average games with uh, with bad officiating and a lot of fouls that aren't called. You know, that's what that's what we live for in the Big Ten. Um, but maybe this year, maybe this year with the league not being as good, maybe we'll have some success in March. You know, that's how March goes. You know, I'm you not know, sure. You can hope. Even, oh, man. Don't don't get my hopes up for that. The Big Ten has been the national media's like laughing stock in March for a decade at this point, and I don't think it's stopping now. Hey, we just we just watched a Big Ten team win the college football national championship and dethrone the South, who's had it for the last ten years, right? This is true. This is this is the year where the Big Ten shocks the world and. The Nebraska Cornhuskers are in the Final Four and win if it all. If that happens, I'll eat a shoe, but I'll be so happy doing it that it won't matter. <laughs> yeah, I – this Nebraska team realistically could make a Final Four. Like, they could. 
They just it, need two guys. They have two guys who get hot for two weeks. It's if, over. If they end up getting like a seven seed, right? They just need a 15 seed to knock off a two seed. And then there's so much chaos. We're seeing it now with the entire AP poll losing last week. Like anyone can yeah, be. Nothing's anyone. out of the question. Nothing's yeah. out of the question. No, yeah. Nebraska, they could, they could be a final four team. All right. Uh, thank you guys all for listening. Once again, links are in the description for us on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, link to our new blog, link to our Twitter, all of that. You can find it below. Make sure you give us a follow on, on Twitter. Make sure that you like and subscribe to wherever you're listening to this podcast. Give us a like, give us a subscribe, um, ring the bell, right? Turn on notifications for our, our podcast. We're dropping weekly at this point. So his big 10 plays ramping up. So, uh, I'd like to thank you guys all for listening and we will see you I guess later this week. Yep. Michigan won the Natty Go Blue.